if you will, turn in your Bibles to the 28th chapter, the book of Proverbs, as we continue our study through the Word. And so we are in this uh, section uh, here, the wise uh, sayings of uh, Solomon and collected uh, now by the scribes of Hezekiah and placed uh, together. And and as we get to this 28th chapter, just how glorious it is that we have the truth of God's word to be able to instruct us and to guide us. God's revelation. We see that the God inspired, the God breathed the word, inerrant, infallible in its original autographs and the absolute certainty of the truth of God's word. We are given a rock upon which we can build our lives. It's not opinion. It's not something that's edited and revised every few years to keep up with an ever-changing culture, but we see that it is the revelation of the character and the heart of God. And in that, as Christ said to pick up our cross and to follow after him, we see that it is given to instruct our hearts and to lead us into righteousness. And and so the, the book of Proverbs, just wisdom, just truth poured out for us to be able to check on our navigation in our lives to be able to bring each of these verses and and to say as the disciples would say lord is that is that i you'll remember when jesus said that one of you is going to betray me and each of the disciples said lord is that is that me is that i and and they examined their their hearts and their lives before christ and and as we come to the proverbs it's the same one with each proverb it's like lord is that a problem in my life is that an area in my life is there a truth here that you're wanting me to respond to or to be able to take that truth and to hide it in your heart for a, a later time that you will be able to use it i I love the fact that the uh, that God tells us that his word will never return back void. In other words, it's always profitable, always profitable to study and to read the word of God. Have you ever done an activity and afterwards you were like, that was worthless? <laughs> <laughs> You'll never say that after reading the word of God. It was never, it's never been worthless. It might not uh, be applicable to you at this moment, but uh, you may find in a week someone is talking to you and you're able to pull out a verse and be able to share it with them. And God planted that in your heart earlier, knowing that you were going to uh, end up in that conversation. And he equips us to be able to minister. And uh, and so just the, the absorbing of the truth the pure, perfect truth uh, of God's uh, word. Verse one, chapter 28. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold uh, as a lion. The wicked. We see throughout, you know, the Proverbs where it talks about, you know, how it can appear that the wicked are prospering and, and that the wicked get away with everything. But here we see that, uh, that the proverb here tells us that the wicked are always looking over their shoulder. You know, when you're breaking the law, when you're doing things that are wrong, when you're not walking in truth, when you're cheating on somebody, you're always looking over your uh, your shoulder. You're always nervous that you are going to get caught. And, and when are you going to get caught? And if you're going to get caught. And so they never are, are at peace. They never can just rest. They never enjoy the sweetness of, uh, of a clean conscience and uh, a pure heart before God. And, and so they, uh, they flee when no one is pursuing. They're afraid that they're being pursued when there's no one uh, that even knows. And, uh, and so how sweet it is, how beautiful it is to just have a, a pure conscience, to be able to be loving God and loving uh, others, to walk authentically and openly and and to be able to love those that are around you because of the transgression of a land many are its princes but by a man of understanding and knowledge right will be prolonged and so 
We see here that uh, transition in leadership and, and too many leaders uh, here, but uh, we see that when a nation is led by righteousness, that it will prosper by a man of understanding and knowledge, not by the multitude of people leading, but the quality of the people that are leading. When a man of understanding and knowledge, we see that righteousness or right is going to be prolonged. It is going to bless a nation. A poor man oppresses the poor. Is like a drive is like a driving rain which leaves no food. And those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. Now, interesting here it says that a poor man who oppresses the poor. Oftentimes we see in the scriptures it talks about the rich that are oppressing or the powerful that are oppressing here, the poor. And and again, the poor means those those that are not able to defender to be able to protect it themselves so it's talking about a helpless person and and so whether or not you're taking advantage when you find a circumstance and situation where you've got leverage and and here it says what happens when a poor person oppresses another poor person it's not just the righteous that I mean not just the rich that will oppress the poor even the poor will uh, oppress the poor and we see that uh, that God abhors uh, that. You remember that Jesus uh, talked about this very issue when uh, there was a man that had a debt he could not pay and uh, he was going to be thrown into the debtor's prison but he begged the master. It was a huge debt that he had and and the master forgave uh, him his debt and then he went to the man that owed him just a few dollars. It's a, a small amount and what happened? He oppressed him. He had him thrown into the uh, the debtor's prison and uh, and so we see here that this principle of not taking advantage of another person's difficult circumstances or or situation the world tells you to leverage every advantage that you have in order to be able to raise yourself uh, up but we see that the word of god tells us that we're to love everybody that is around us. And when someone is downtrodden or they're in a weakened state, we're not to take advantage and exploit that, but we're to cover that, we're to help, and we're to undergird and come along and strengthen them. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, uh, it says. And, uh, and so, once again, a person that departs from the standard of God is going to praise others that have withstood the counsel of uh, God, but as such as keep the law are going to contend with them. And so we want to stand against evil wherever we find it. Amen. And we see here that a person that's compromised is not going to stand against the evil, not in themselves, uh, or they're not going to stand against it in, in others uh, or in our culture or in our community. And, uh, and so those that keep the law are going to contend with unrighteousness. Evil men, verse 5, do not understand justice. But those who seek the Lord understand all. A godly person understands justice, but not only justice, but uh, also a lot more. The godly person seeks now the Lord, fears the Lord, and, and is seeking to walk according to the wisdom that is revealed to us in God's uh, word. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways that though he be rich. Many people look down upon poverty and they think that being poor is the worst thing in the, in the world and, and that we want to do is, you know, we want to stamp out world poverty. We want to stamp out poverty, you know, wherever it is. But we see that righteousness is more important than riches. You know, would that we try and stamp out all injustice uh, in the world. We, uh, we see that this is a, a much more nobler goal than, uh, than to try and to seek 
to, to overcome poverty. Jesus said that hey, you will always have the poor. The poor, uh, we are always going to have that opportunity to be able to minister to the poor. But uh, we see that better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways, though he be rich. So there's something far worse than being poor, and that is uh, to be a person that does not have uh, integrity. God cares about our character, amen? cares about your character and my character. Why? Because as a Christ follower, we want to reflect the character of God. And so we see that it is a bad witness. It is a bad testimony of God. And, and so this is the reason that God is seeking to change our character to be able to reflect uh, him. Whoever keeps the law, it says in verse 7, is a discerning son, but a companion of gluttons shames his father. We see a companion of gluttons. We see what does a glutton do? A glutton takes and squanders that which is precious. And, uh, and so again, it is stewardship. God has entrusted us to learn the, the value and the quality of being a good steward, of, uh, of taking good care. A and we see that God has given to each and every one of us a body. He has placed our soul inside of our body. And so we are to be stewards uh, of this body, to be a good steward, to keep it healthy and to keep it functioning well. Why? So that we can now be used mightily. And so we need to be healthy to be able to be you so God gives us a body we're to be good stewards over it. God's given us time and we're to be a good steward over the time and not to squander the time that God has given to us now how much time has God given to us nobody knows uh, that but we do know that he gives us 24 hours in a day and I get 24 hours and you get 24 hours except on Sunday you're only going to get 23 uh, but normally it's 24 uh, and and we all get the same amount and uh, and so in that how did you take your 24 hours how much time did you spend with the Lord? How much time did you spend in godly activities? How much time did you spend in, in worship in the 24 hours? How, how much of it were you cognizant of the presence of God in your life? You had 24 hours, I had 24 hours. Every single person got 24 hours. How did you use your 24 uh, hours and uh, and so the stewardship over time the stewardship over your talents God has placed talents in each and every single one of us he's given you spiritual gifts he's given me spiritual gifts and now those gifts were given to us we didn't earn them or deserve them they were given them but now we're entrusted with the stewardship of those gifts what what did we do with the gifts uh, that uh, that God gave uh, to us and and I remember that it was that that very verse of the stewardship of the uh, in the parables that, that Christ talks about and and I remember that I was sitting in Costa Mesa and, uh, and Pastor Chuck was talking uh, about the talents that uh, to one he gave five, to another he gave three, another he gave one, and, and then the master returned and, uh, and he asked, what, what did you do with your talent? The first one came, I had the five talents and, and I made five more and, uh, and here they are, stewardship. You were entrusted with these talents and they're not yours but you're entrusted with them, what are you going to do with them? And to another, he had given two talents and, uh, and he had taken and made two more and gave that. And then to the other, he had given one and the one had buried it uh, in the ground. And, uh, and so the Lord said, you, you wicked servant. And he took the one and uh, gave it to the others. But it was in the middle of, of the Lord asking the, the master now of, of how many talents you had done that that the Lord spoke to my heart just as clearly probably the first time one of the first times in my life uh, that the Lord really spoke to me and, and the Lord said to me he said when are you going to let me use your talent that I gave you and I about just dropped 
dropped uh, my jaw. I knew that he wasn't talking about money. I knew exactly what he was um, talking about because my entire life, God had given me the capacity and the ability to teach and to be able to connect with people. And I'd always used that in the business world to be able to uh, enrich myself. And, and all of a sudden he said, when are you going to let me use the talent that I put inside of you? And I was like, Oh God, I'm not listening. You know, I, I don't. That scared me. You know, that was that was the first time that I ever heard God talk to me and begin to uh, to draw me now to be able to to use me, to use you, to use everybody. It's that you know He gave us the very gifts, and and I was using those gifts elsewhere, and and He allowed that for a season till now. He said they they're mine. When can I redeem those gifts for a higher purpose than, than you just using the gifts? And, and so stewardship, learning the stewardship. I'm not my own. I, I've been bought at a price and everything that I have is, is the Lord's. And, and the treasure, the money that I have is God's. My savings account, it's God's. Whatever he wants to, uh, to do with it, that, that money has is, is just been entrusted to, to me to be a good steward uh, over and to be able to allow him to direct it wherever he, uh, he wants to direct it. And so, so we learn about stewardship that my whole life, uh, as a believer, as a Christian, is all about stewardship in every single area. Before, uh, before you know, I was saved, everything was mine. I mean, it was all mine and me. And now it's just, I'm just a steward over whatever God has given to me. Nothing is mine. It's all God's. And, and so that principle of uh, stewardship. And so better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. That person that's perverse in their ways in order to, to accumulate things is, does not understand and has not grown to a recognition of stewardship uh, in their life. Whoever keeps the law is discerning son, but a companion of glutton shames his fathers, and one who increases his possessions by usury and extortion gathers it for him who will pity the poor. And, uh, and so uh, here again we see that this is now talking about uh, a person who is materialistic and they are seeking to uh, leverage uh, any advantage that they have, even an immoral advantage here. We see that usury now is to charge an unfair interest rate on something that you have uh, loaned. And, and we see extortion is using uh, your power in order to be able to cheat uh, or to steal. And, uh, and, and so now we have immoral leveraging in order to prosper. And, and what does God say about that? He says, I'm not going to let you get away with that. I'm not, you're not going to get away with that. We see that they're not going to allow these, uh, these oppressions to have the last word. God ultimately has the last word. Amen? And, and so God just warns them, you know, uh, that you may accumulate it, but uh, you're not going to be able to, uh, to keep it. It's going to be taken uh, from you. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer, is an abomination. And whoever causes the upright to go astray in an evil way, he himself will fall into his own pit. But the blameless will inherit good. So uh, we see it says, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law. What, it, what does that mean? It, it means of the person that doesn't want to hear the truth that doesn't want to know the truth. They want to hold on to what they believe and they want to be comfortable in it and they don't have the ears to hear, ears to hear the truth. Jesus oftentimes when he would talk would say, he who has an ear to hear, what? Let him hear if you have ears to hear. Why? Because there's people that just don't want to hear the truth. And, and it's interesting, those people that are closed off, they have an opinion, they don't want to discuss or talk about uh, truth. The, the Bible tells us that, uh, that to such a person, it says don't argue with them. It says that that's like taking and throwing pearls before swine. That uh, Pearls are valuable. But if, if you put them before a swine, they'll just eat it like it's slop. They won't value it and they will disregard it. Truth is precious 
It, it's the revelation of God himself. And, uh, and so when a person doesn't have ears to hear, taking and trying to put truth before them, they'll just trample on it and they'll despise uh, you for it. But uh, here we see that the opposite of that is a person has a teachable spirit. A person says, Lord, I want to keep on growing in truth. I want to keep on growing in wisdom and in knowledge. I, I want to continue to, to understand you more and, and more as I grow. And so it is that pursuit of truth, the stopping of the ears uh, or pursuing truth. Now, one of the qualities that you know, was amazing about King David is it says that he was a man that chased after the heart of God. And, and I love that. I mean, the thought of chasing after mm, a heart. And, you know, it makes me to think about, you know, when a, a man is trying to court a girl and the, and the extremes that he will go to to chase after the heart of, uh, uh, of this woman or, or the way that a woman will chase after the heart of a man. And, uh, and to think about chasing after the heart uh, of God. Now, David was this incredible king, right? He's this warrior. He's not even allowed to build the, uh, the temple because he's a man of war. You know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David, his ten thousands, you know, this is a, 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 a military strategist who is a, an amazing leader of men. And yet uh, at the same time, he's a poet uh, and this musician that writes the Psalms and, uh, and sits there and just meditates on the character of God, writing love poems. That's what the Psalms are, love poems to, uh, to God, a man chasing after the the heart of God and and so we want to be men and women that chase after the heart of God amen and and, and so we want to be people that have ears to hear we we never want to close our hearts or close our ears to the truth regardless of how painful that is because you see if you if you want to close off your ears it's because you're afraid <laughs> of what that truth is going to mean to your your life and and so kind of that, you know, don't ask, don't tell. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. It's like, if I don't know that what I'm doing is wrong, then I don't have to stop doing it. But then the minute that I know that it's wrong, then I know I'm going to have to uh, stop doing it. But we want to continue to have that soft character before the Lord, that soft heart that allows God to, to change us. Don't don't be afraid of God and don't be afraid to obey God because God has your best interest at heart. It, it might not feel like it at, at, at times. He may ask you to, to do some things that are hard and that are uncomfortable, that are gonna stretch you. And, uh, but those are all good things uh, in your life. I, I don't believe that anybody is, is, is ever disappointed because they obeyed God. But I know so many people that are so disappointed because they disobeyed God. And so we want to, to always allow God to keep leading us even when it is uh, uncomfortable. You will love the end result as God is just seeking to, to change us and to grow us. And, and so one who turns his ear from hearing the law it says even his prayer is, a, is an abomination. We see that, that someone who refuses to listen to God, who refuses to obey God, we see that they're not going to pray according to God's will. They're not going to pray according to God's will. Whoever causes the upright to go astray in an evil way, we see this is a person that's trying to, to take and corrupt somebody who is morally pure. And it's interesting that when you become corrupted, you want to corrupt others. When you've been introduced to evil, you want to introduce others to, to evil. That is the principle of, uh, of sin and the nature of sin. You, you know the familiar verse that says that a little leaven leavens what? the whole lump and so corruption wants to mm, corrupt and uh, and so here we see the warning against it. it says whoever causes the upright to go astray in an evil way he himself will fall into his own pit but the blameless will inherit good the blameless will inherit good god has a way of protecting his uh, 
uh, upright, but he will judge those who now cause uh, others to stumble. You know, remember that Jesus had some pretty severe uh, words about those that stumbled others. If anybody stumbles one of my children, it would be better that a millstone would be mm, tied around his neck and they would be cast into the, uh, the lake than, uh, than for them to stumble my little children. The rich man is wise in his own eyes, but the poor who has understanding searches him out. And when the righteous rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. And, uh, and so the, the rich man is wise in his uh, own eyes. We uh, see here that uh, that not every rich man uh, has gained his wealth through wisdom. We see that uh, many Proverbs explain that, that, that wealth uh, is oftentimes going to be the result of wisdom. But uh, we see here that, uh, that not every person that is rich has gained it through uh, wisdom. Verse 13, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy and uh, it says whoever confesses and forsakes and so notice that we, when we confess our sins and we're asking for forgiveness we need that there needs to be a repentance there needs to be a turning uh, away a forsaking uh, of our sins uh, in, in our life and so God is gracious to forgive but uh, we see also that we are to turn from our sin you'll remember the woman who was caught in adultery and uh, and when Jesus writes down bends down and writes down and and when he stands back up he asks where are your accusers and he says there are none and he says and neither do i uh, accuse you you're forgiven he says but go and sin no more you've experienced the grace of god now the forgiveness of god now change your conduct change your behavior and and not out of fear but because of the mercy of god because of the grace of god it says it's your kindness lord that leads me to repentance it's so interesting you know we think it's your punishment lord that leads me to you know repentance and so oftentimes we can have that severe you know opinion of god and we think that god is you know mad at us or god is out to punish us or god is out to get us and you know and the, and then when he's punished us that's going to teach us a lesson and and we'll turn but the bible said it, that it's your kindness it's your goodness that leads you to repentance how long suffering is god how long suffering with with me he is and and how long suffering he is with you and and his long suffering and his the kindness and the goodness of his nature makes me not want to sin makes me not want to hurt my relationship with him it's not because of punishment that makes me in turn it's because of love and so Punishment and fear uh, is never going to ever motivate you to the same degree and level that love will motivate you. Love will take you far beyond. It's the most powerful force in the world. And so God is seeking to draw you, listen, not into a, a, a more obedient relationship. He's, he's wanting to draw you into a more loving relationship. And the more loving relationship that you have with God, obedience is going to be the byproduct of it. And, and so the question isn't whether or not you're obeying God. The question is whether or not you love God. And so the more that you fall in love with God, the, the more that your behaviors are going to, to change in your life out of a heart of love, not out of rules and, and regulations. That, that's the big difference between the old covenant and the new covenant and, and how the old covenant was all about rules and regulations. But and Jesus is a new commandment I've given you. In other words, I can summarize the whole law, love one another. That's the new commandment. That, that's the summary uh, of our relationship uh, with God. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. And, uh, and so there is a, a place for laughter and fun and joking, but reverence. We see it tells us uh, here that happy is the man who is most of the time reverent. <laughs> no, uh, who is 
always uh, reverence. So make sure that your, your humor is always reverent, not the double entendres, not the edgy stuff that, uh, the, that pushes uh, the, the envelope uh, here. God loves uh, humor. He gave us our sense of humor, but he wants a sanctified sense of humor, amen? Uh, and so uh, here we see that, uh, that now, you know, make sure, happy is the man who is always reverent. And in uh, verse 14, speaks against the condition of, of the heart. He who hardens his heart. And, uh, and so what hardens a person's heart? Bitterness, unforgiveness is what hardens a person's uh, heart. Is there anybody in your life that you haven't forgiven for, for anything? And I, and I think that, you know, sometimes people will give themselves permission. Maybe you've done this yourself or heard other people say this, that, uh, that I'm not going to forgive that person until they dot, 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 <laughs> fill in, until they apologize to me, till they, till I see change in it, till I, blah, blah. And they put conditions on the forgiveness, on, on forgiving somebody else, as if now they're justified in withholding the forgiveness you know, thinking that when they forgive them that that's, that that's somehow going to bless that person and they're not going to give their blessing until the, they see something and, and how wrong that thinking is. Because you see, when you don't forgive, it's hardening your own heart. You're not hurting the other person. The, God calls us to forgive them, not if they dot, dot, dot. I have not found that verse yet, <laughs> you know. Forgive them if, uh, you know, they promise never to do it again and they, and they actually said it like they meant it because you didn't say it like you meant it. And so until you say it like you mean it, I'm not going to forget. And, and the conditions of, uh, uh, of all of this. But uh, you remember that... Uh, uh, that the reason that we forgive is because we've been forgiven. It's back to that parable of the man that was f forgiven a huge debt and then, and then somebody else had a small debt and with them. We look at the, the sins that we've committed against God and he's forgiven all of them and then they've sinned against us. Yes, they were wrong. They, they sinned against us. But we're not to put conditions on the forgiveness. We're just to simply mm, forgive them. And, uh, and so, you know, forgiveness is a state of the heart. You for can forgive somebody that's not even alive. You for can forgive somebody that you've been holding on to unforgiveness with someone that, uh, that did things to you or hurt you when you were young. They're not even alive, but you're still holding on to that, that bitterness in your heart. You know what? You can let that go and you can just forgive them before the Lord to where I forgive every single action that's ever been done against me that was wrong, God, because I thank you that you've forgiven me for every single sin that I've ever committed against you. And then you know what? I'm free. I'm free. And so the, the hardness of heart comes from that lack of bitterness of that lack of forgiveness and turns into bitterness and 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 bitterness what does it do it, it hardens the heart and it prevents the heart from being able to love and so you know you, you have little you have five percent hardness of heart so now you're only working with 95 percent of, uh, of a soft heart and then 30 percent 60 percent and 80 percent hard and now you have just a small capacity to love others. And, and so by having unforgiveness in your heart, you lose the capacity, listen, to love the people that you want to love. You're losing your capacity at hurting yourself and hurting the people that, uh, that you do love. And so he who hardens his heart is going to fall into calamity. Like a roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked ruler over poor people. And, uh, and so again, here we just uh, see that people are going to be affected now by the quality of their rulers. A ruler who lacks understanding is a great oppressor, but he who hates covetousness will prolong his days. We want to hate what God hates. We want to love what God loves. And, and so covetousness a person who is seeking to to what they they are seeking to find their identity in their possessions right 
They're seeking to find their identity in their possessions. That's a covetous person. So they want to feel better about themselves. So they want to they collect things to make them feel better. But as a child of God, our identity is in Christ. Uh, and so that's where our identity is, not in what you own or what you wear or what you drive or, uh, or, or anything else. My identity is I'm a child of God, washed, cleansed, forgiven. I'm on the way to heaven and Jesus is my Lord. That's my identity uh, now. And so uh, a man burdened with bloodshed will flee into a pit, let no one help him. Whoever walks blamelessly will be saved, but he who is perverse in his ways will suddenly fall and so a person guilty of bloodshed we see a person who is perverse we see that there is the the warnings against uh, uh, these things he who tills his land will have plenty of bread but he who follows frivolity will uh, have poverty enough uh, once again, we see that over and over, we've talked about it, the theme of, uh, of being a hard worker and not being uh, lazy. A, a faithful man will abound with blessings, uh, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. A person who hastens to be rich. Now, what does that mean? It means that they're not a good steward over their time. They're trying too hard to force a single objective. They're putting too much effort and focus uh, uh, into riches uh, in their life. They may even be covetous. Uh, that may be a, a person who is focused on riches. They believe that riches are going to make them happy. And, and what they don't understand is, is, is that in God's presence is the fullness of joy, not, not in the accumulation of, uh, of coins and, and of uh, precious metals. And, and so we see verse 21, to show partiality is not good because for a piece of bread, a man will transgress. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. And, and so there are many different types of poverty. There is poverty of love. There is spiritual poverty. Uh, that a person experiences uh, loneliness, isolation. We see that they've spent their time, the workaholic seeks to bury themselves in achievement, but their life is loveless. They end up divorced. They end up estranged from their children all the while in the back of their head saying, I was doing it all for them. But the truth of the matter is they were doing it for themselves, that they were selfish and avoiding uh, what they found to be difficult, which was intimacy and honesty and relationship and, and love. And, and so uh, here we see that uh, a person that is hastily chasing after is going to end up with an impoverished life. There, there is a way that seems right unto a man whose end is destruction. And, and that is that pursuit of, uh, of riches. They think that it's going to make them happy. But by the time they get there, they found out it's cost them everything to get there, and they have nothing. He who rebukes a man will find, verse 23, more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue. And whoever robs his father or his mother and says, it is no transgression, the same is companion to a, uh, a destroyer. We, we see a person that rebukes uh, uh, is, will find more favor than a person who flatters. Why? Because a rebuke was truthful and a flatter was dishonest. And in the end, relationships are always built on truth, not on lies and manipulation. And so there should be no part of manipulation and no part of lying in our uh, relationships. We want to walk in uprightness and we want to walk in transparency uh, with uh, one another. He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord uh, will be prospered. And he who trusts in his own heart is a what? Is a fool. 
<laughs> but whoever walks so wisely will be delivered. You know, it's so hard. So, you know, it, it's difficult to watch a movie with me, you know, because when they get to the part where they're, you're just, you just have to follow your heart. I'm like, no! You know, I start yelling, that's the worst thing you can do! You know, and, and it always comes up in the ring. You've got to follow your heart. Just follow your heart. I say, no, you're a fool. Read Proverbs. That's a fool. That's bad counsel. You all need to be in church is what you guys need to be, you know, uh, and stuff. But, you know, uh, uh, here again, that's, uh, I'm working through it, okay? So I'm just <laughs> working through it here. It's just a movie, John. It's just a movie. They're just, I know. Just, you know. He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. And when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. But when they perish, the righteous increase. When the wicked are ruling, the, the wise people, they just get out of the way. They just go and avoid uh, because there is great hardship that comes upon them. When they perish, the righteous will increase. Chapter 29 is more wise sayings of Solomon. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, uh, the people groan. And uh, so I think that that's true of presidents as well, you know, uh, as it is when the righteous are in authority, people are rejoicing. And so I'll let you figure that out. Verse 3. <laughs> Whoever loves wisdom uh, makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots wastes uh, his wealth. <laughs> and there again you have that stewardship, 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 wasting, wasting. We see that God never wastes anything. God never even wastes our tears. He never wastes he, even our, our sorrows or our hardship. And, and God doesn't want us to be wasteful uh, either. He wants us to learn to be good stewards in our life over everything and to be balanced in that. The king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives it bribes, uh, overthrows it. And, uh, and so again, the, the integrity of our judicial system, uh, you need to have uh, honest and truthful judges that will administrate justice fairly and blindly and, uh, and so we need to be praying for our judges uh, here uh, as well. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. And, uh, and once again, flattery, flattery, flattery. What is flattery? Flattery uh, is a compliment that's used as a manipulation. Right? We're called to build one another uh, up. Uh, and, and even flattery can be truthful in its compliment, but its motive is not honest. There, there is a, a leveraging, there is a reason for the compliment to, uh, to position or to move the relationship uh, where a person wants it. And, uh, and so we are called to, to be able to exhort, to encourage, to build up and to compliment, but flattery has a selfish motivation, isn't meant to build the other person up, uh, but it is for your own personal uh, gain. By transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings uh, and rejoices. And so, uh, once again, that free heart when you are forgiven, when you're right with God and you're right with others, you know, it, it is just so glorious to be able to sing and to rejoice. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. We see that that's compassion. The righteous considers the cause of the poor. Empathy, putting yourself in the position of others and feeling what they're feeling. We see the wicked doesn't understand, never thinks about the harm and the hurt of others. They only think about themselves. And so they leave behind just a, a trail of devastation. Scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath and remember we see the Bible tells us that a soft answer turns away wrath you know so important in relationships that we not escalate in our 
communication with uh, one another and especially in our marriages and our, our, our families. We need the ability to be able to call timeouts, to be able to avoid uh, wrath, to give a soft uh, answer and, and to not allow the emotion to escalate up to where now words are, are being used as weapons uh, and they're charged with emotion and then afterwards they, I didn't really mean that and, and we're having to take those words back God doesn't want us to get to those places he wants us to be able to learn how to how to keep things productive in our conversation and the minute listen to this when should you call a timeout the minute that you reach a point where anything beyond here is going to be counterproductive when when you know that from this point forwards that nothing productive is going to happen that's the time to stop it and do you know what either person can stop an argument it's just a matter you're in a tug of war just one side needs to drop the rope, <laughs> the rope in order to just stop and important when you call a time out that you validate the issue it's not avoidance uh, it's uh, this is an important issue and we, we need to resolve this and we need to talk about it but right now this isn't productive let's talk about this and then when you call a time out it's important that you set the time that you will talk about it let's take a break for a half hour and come back and talk about this in 30 uh, in 30 minutes you pray i'll pray we'll meet back in 30 minutes and we'll keep on uh, going and so uh, the importance of the ability to be able to just comment give a soft answer return back to the table again because you can't avoid you have to resolve uh, unity is only comes about by resolving the issue not not talking about it. And, and so unresolved conflict puts weight on every single relationship. And so uh, you need to get the issues resolved and you need to get work through them, but you need to be able to do that respectfully with a calm heart, keeping your emotions in check. And so that ability to be able to turn away wrath is such an important skill uh, in our life. If a wise man, verse nine, contends with a foolish man, whether the fool raises or laughs there is no peace and the bloodthirsty hate the blameless but the upright and seek his well-being and so violent men they, they hate what is good uh, and, and the just though we see that the righteous person always wants to see justice for everybody a fool vents uh, how much of his feelings all of his feelings and so you know when you're using that to justify venting well that's just didn't you want to know how I feel and I'm just expressing you know my feelings to you you know right now well that's not always profitable and it's always not always the best course of uh, of action sometimes you need to calm down process through your emotions to discover what you're really feeling not what I was feeling at the moment but what do you really feel? How do you really feel? And so uh, that's uh, what is uh, important. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man uh, holds them back to be able to sift through them to find out what are true. Why? Because feelings can be deceitful. The heart is deceitful among all things. And, and one minute I feel this way, and the next minute I feel this way. Well, which do you really feel? I don't know. Then figure it out. And when, when you figure out how you really feel, now, uh, now that's the time to be able to, uh, to communicate uh, on that. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become uh, wicked. When you reward bad behavior, what are you going to get? bad behavior <laughs> and so uh, here we see the poor man and the oppressor have this in common the Lord gives light to the eyes of both the king who judges the poor with truth his throne will be established uh, forever and uh, so we see a principle here that God will bless rulers that are concerned about the poor people why because God champions the poor God champions the uh, the widow and the fatherless and uh, and so verse 15 the rod and rebuke give wisdom but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother and so uh, the the importance of training up a child in the way that they should go there is a training that uh, happens there is some 
self-discovery that is important in, in a child's life, but an untrained child will become wild. And so that will be a shame to the parents and, and to the mother. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous will see their fall. And so the wicked will eventually fall. You just see this over and over and over and over and over. And so uh, once again, don't ever become envious of the, uh, of the wicked because they uh, will fall. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. And where there is no revelation, and the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps uh, the uh, law. And so uh, we see that uh, helping uh, to uh, obey God's law ultimately is going to bring happiness uh, in a person's uh, life. And verse 19, a servant will not be corrected by mere words, for though he understands, he will not respond. And do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool uh, than for him. And so uh, hasty in the word means that they're not processing. They don't have a filter. They're a loose cannon with the things that, uh, that they are saying. And your words, when they are not thought through and held in check, they are going to bring uh, calamity upon yourself. He who pampers his servant from childhood will have him as a son uh, in the end. And uh, an angry man stirs up strife and a furious man abounds uh, in transgression. Person who pampers his servant from childhood, that's a picture of discipleship, of discipling others, of, of loving and investing and pouring into. And it says that when you do that, you're gonna end up with them as a son uh, in the end. The beauty of, uh, of discipling and walking alongside uh, of others. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain uh, honor. And so here again, we see the over and over in Proverbs, the warning against pride, uh, that pride comes before a, a fall. And so pride is gonna cause you to stumble or to fall. Here it says a man's pride will bring him low. That's a person that's fallen or a person who has stumbled, but the humble in spirit will retain uh, honor. And so uh, humility, what is humility? It's, it's not thinking uh, more of yourself than you ought to. That, that is humility. Humility comes by comparing yourself to Christ. When you compare yourself to Christ, how, how are you looking? <laughs> you know, when you compare yourself to the person next to you, don't look at them. But when you compare yourself to them, how are you looking? You know, uh, not, and you, you, you start to judge. You become judgmental. Listen, when you compare others to yourself, when you start to make your sense, I can't believe that they didn't have enough common sense to blah, blah, and blah. And, and what did you just do? You just used your own standard of common sense to be able to measure them uh, up against you put them down, judge them, but you've also exalted yourself. And it's so subtle. It's, it, it, it is so easy to be able to do that. But, but when you stop taking yourself as the standard, you make Christ the standard, and then you judge yourself against Christ first. Jesus said that be careful to take the plank out of your own eye before you try and remove the speck from your mm, brother's uh, eye. And, uh, and so that critical spirit, that judgmental mm, spirit exalts your own standards and measures people up against your own standards instead of measuring them up against the standard of Christ. And so whoever is a partner with a thief hates his own life. He swears to tell the truth, but uh, reveals uh, nothing. And, uh, and so here again, if you're going to partner with a thief, uh, that thief is ultimately going to steal from you. <laughs> and so uh, here we see that it's speaking about in character in relationships with people that don't have in character. And ultimately we see that that lack of character, you are going to be on the other end uh, of that lack of character. A, a person that gossips to you, gossips 
about you as well. The next person, you're going to be the story that they're telling the next person too. It's that, that lack of character. When you're in a relationship with a person with lack of character, that lack of character is ultimately going to uh, end up uh, towards uh, you uh, in that. And so <laughs> whoever's a partner with a thief uh, hates his own life. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And many seek the ruler's favor, but justice for a man comes from the Lord. The fear of man brings a snare. That's a people pleaser. That, that's you're so concerned with wanting the approval of others that you will surrender important core values in yourself in order to be able to attain that approval of others. And it's a snare. And it's a snare. You should never be sacrificing yourself in order to gain the approval of others. The only approval that we need is the approval of God. And when we are upright and walking in, in relationship with God, seeking his approval, then we are going to be blessed. Whoever trusts in the Lord, it says, shall be safe. And many seek the ruler's favor, but justice for man comes from the Lord. We see that ultimately God is in control. Amen? God is in control. And so uh, ultimately justice comes from the Lord. An unjust man uh, is an abomination to the righteous. And he who is upright in, in the ways is an abomination to the wicked. And so we, uh, we see the dichotomy. The, uh, the wicked are opposed to the righteous and the righteous are opposed uh, to uh, the wicked. Jesus said that a servant is not above his master. They hated me. They're going to hate you uh, as well. The minute that you won't walk with the world, you, you are an enemy to the culture and to the world and to the direction that they are going. And that is a byproduct of the fact that there is a war <laughs> between uh, the righteous and the wicked. And the minute that you stepped into the Lord's camp, uh, you now have engaged uh, the wicked. Uh, and so you are never going to be accepted uh, by the wicked and the wicked don't accept the righteous and the righteous will not accept the wicked and, and we see that and Jesus said it this way what does light and darkness have in fellowship with uh, with one another with communion with uh, one another and so knowing that not being surprised uh, by it uh, so that we can fully turn our face and towards the Lord Love him with uh, all of our heart and continue to march forwards underneath his banner. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, you are so good. We love you. We thank you. And God, we're only responding to the great love that, that you've already given to us. And, and so, Lord, would you just go before us, help us to continue to grow in the the grace and knowledge of you and uh, and father help us in our relationships and and bless our families and lord prosper all that we put our hands to it's in jesus holy and precious name we pray amen